Okay, members, the sitting is resumed and it's time for questions to the Executive Office. And I call John Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number one. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this provision has been part of our law since 1976. It was introduced to maintain a balance in the religious composition of the teaching workforce by allowing schools in the control sector to have regard to community background of teachers when making appointments. Schools within the maintained sector may be able to rely upon the occupational requirement of a religious education qualification for appointments to post within that sector. Things have changed since 1976, and we need to review this provision. Our officials have had some preliminary engagement with the Department of Education, as any such review will be taken forward collaboratively with the education sector. Progress on this work has been impeded, of course, by the current crisis and pressure on staff uh, and ministerial time. Supplementary, John Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the First Minister for her answer. I have to say I am exacerbated by just how long this has taken. Uh, the only employment in Northern Ireland that does not on, operate under fair employment laws is teaching. And I know colleagues of mine for many years have been highlighting this issue and it has batted back and forth between the Executive Office and the Education Ministers. How, Mr. Speaker, can we even begin to move towards a shared and single education system when it is perfectly legal to discriminate against a teacher based on their background? Can I ask the First Minister, where is the blockage and change coming from? Is it coming from the Department of Education? Is it vested interests? Is it church or is it teaching unions? Who is against equality? So I, I want to thank the member for his supplementary and indeed his question because I, I do share the frustration that he has uh, in relation to this issue. It seems like we've been talking about this forever in terms of the fair employment um, exemption and indeed um, the certificate uh, for religious education in the maintained sector. Um, of course, um, we understand why the maintained sector would seek to have that for a, a number of teachers, but why should all teachers have to have that certificate for religious education if you're applying to the maintained sector? So I do share the members. Um, deep frustration uh, around this. All I can say to the member is that it's something that I feel needs to be dealt with, um, and I want to say that very clearly because he's asked where's the blockage. Certainly not with me, because I believe that there's a, a need to deal with this issue. And he's right. If we are to have sharing across Northern Ireland, then of course we should have it uh, with our school teachers. Nicole, Nicola Brogan. I thank Carla and I thank the Minister for her answer. Can the Minister outline what um, in preliminary engagement, stakeholder engagement has taken place on this topic so far, please? I can say to the member and thank the member for her question. There's been a, a range of engagement with key stakeholders. This goes back quite a number of years, actually, before this assembly was reconstituted in 2007. Uh, so we have taken a number of views on the teacher's exemption. Uh, indeed, uh, in the last Assembly mandate, and uh, officials will re-engage with this work um, as soon as they can, given the pandemic pressures, uh, particularly with staffing uh, within our own office uh, and indeed uh, within the Department of Education as well. There is a need, uh, a very clear need, to deal with this matter, uh, and I hope that she understands that that's my position. And I call Paula Bradshaw. Question number two, please. So, Mr. Speaker, with your permission, Junior Minister Lyons will answer this question. Uh, as agreed by the Executive on the 25th of March, the FICT Working Group has started engagement with departments to develop a FICT work plan for executive consideration. Subject to any emerging pressures, this work will be completed over the coming months. Supplementary. Paula Bradshaw. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for, for the response. I'm, I'm just conscious that. A lot of work went into the development of the draft report, and that included the stakeholder engagement. I am just wondering, going forward, will there be representatives from different sections of society on that working group, and also what input will local councils have? Thank you. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, I do want to thank the Commission for the work that they have been involved in. They have produced a, a very comprehensive report with um, many recommendations uh, as well. Um, we have decided that this should be a whole executive um, approach that is taken, 
um, because we want to get that maximum buy-in, um, because I think it's only whenever we're all working together um, that we're actually going to get um, some of the results that we want to see and whenever there's buy-in from, from everybody. So first and foremost, what we want to see is the executive as a whole leading this rather than just the, the executive office. But of course, as we develop um, a, a plan and as we consider implementation, it may well be appropriate to engage with other outside agencies and bodies, including councils. And as a working group, we'll be prepared to, to look at uh, all of that uh, and engage where necessary. Call Pat Kettner. Having a good phone call, yeah. Given the recent violence uh, witnessed on our streets, uh, does the Minister feel that other important resources, such as the anti-poverty strategy, must be considered as part of the implementation of any outcomes from the Commission on Flags, Identity, Culture and Tradition? Well, Mr. Speaker, first and foremost, it is important that we that we condemn the violence uh, wherever it comes from and, and when, where, wherever uh, it happens. And as a house, I think we have been united uh, on that. Uh, there are many causes um, for some of the disturbances and the violence that we have uh, seen uh, lately, and those need to be addressed uh, in in different ways. Um, I think that FICT will, will play an important part uh, in that. It's about uh, recognising people's identity, recognising uh, their culture, um, making sure that they feel supported uh, in that as well. So FICT has a role to play uh, in all of this, but by no means is it going to be um, the, the, the silver bullet. Thank the Minister for his answers thus far. And I welcome the progress made by the FICT report uh, and uh, increased equality, respect and parity of esteem must be the outworkings of the FICT report. And as we all know, function in North South structures are critical for the successful operation of the Good Friday Agreement and uh, the cancellation of a number of meetings recently because of the refusal of unionist, or unionist ministers to attend was a retrograde step. So I wonder, would the minister agree with me that playing politics with the Good Friday Agreement is disrespectful to uh, the people who voted for the Good Friday Agreement and risks undermining the agreement itself? Well, uh, first of all, Mr. Speaker, I congratulate the member on being able to turn a question on the um, Commission on Flags, Identity, Culture and Tradition uh, into uh, a question about the North South um, Ministerial Council. I think he knows it has nothing to do with it whatsoever, um, but I think that our position on that has been uh, made clear that when these meetings uh, take place, uh, they need to take place uh, at an agreed time uh, and that papers need to be uh, agreed as well. He does raise the interesting matter of the um, Good Friday Agreement. Uh, and I think that there's a lot of um, a lot of members around this house um, that are not concerned uh, about the outworkings of the Good Friday Agreement, the consent principle, and Northern Ireland's place uh, within the United Kingdom. So I would urge uh, the member uh, to recognise those parts of the Good Friday Agreement uh, as well, uh, recognise the problems, in particular that the that the protocol is causing, and seek to, to work with others uh, to to sort that out. Oh, Christopher I thank uh, the Minister for his answers thus far. Identity, culture and tradition are important as well as functioning institutions of government. Would the member agree with me that it was disrespectful to refuse to turn up to work for three years? Well, uh, Mr Speaker, I think that we can uh, all agree uh, that three years of uh, no government here in Northern Ireland um, was detrimental, detrimental to people right across Northern Ireland. Many of the issues uh, that we need to see addressed in our society um, could have been uh, progressed had we actually had functioning government here uh, in uh, Northern Ireland. And I think that all members um, should uh, reflect uh, on that uh, and recognise the, the problems that that has caused. I call Melissa McHugh. Uh, Cash to three, uh, number three. Mr. Speaker, again, with your permission, Junior Minister Lyons will answer this question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the Executive has agreed to a further phase of the Tackling Paramilitary Activity, Criminality and Organised Crime Programme, which is led by the Department of Justice to be delivered up until March 2024. Within the wider programme, the Executive Office has lead responsibility for the Communities in Transition project, which will be a significant part of the community-facing element of the programme in Phase 2. Our officials have used the past number of months to engage across the eight areas of focus to inform draft proposals for Phase 2 delivery. 
A contribution of £10 million has been made available from the Northern Ireland Office to support the Communities in Transition project over three years, up to March 2024. This funding is to support preventative work within communities that will build their resilience to paramilitary and criminal elements. And contrary to recent media reports, uh, Mr. Speaker, this funding is not designed to support paramilitary organisations becoming community groups. It should also be noted that the Communities in Transition project is only one of the many interventions that are being funded as part of the Tackling Paramilitarism programme, which also includes policing responses and focused youth interventions, among others. A lasting impact, however, will only be achieved with all parts of the programme operating in partnership. Thank you for your answer. Uh, and the programme and its extensions to be welcomed. And I'd like to see it geographically extended as well to include areas uh, that of which I represent myself, i.e. the likes of Strabane and so on. Uh, and that can you give us any assurances in what way that you actually will address and ensure that uh, none of this funding will be provided to organised crime gangs as part of the community in transition? Well, um Mr. Speaker, as, as somebody who has had the interventions in my own constituency, I can see the benefits of the Communities in Transition uh, project and can understand um, why people want to see them extended uh, into other areas. And feedback that we have had with elected representatives has suggested that there are further uh, geographic areas which could uh, benefit from a focus on the Communities in Transition uh, project and if sufficient funding was available. Um, these areas may include but are not limited to uh, Chantalo, Tigers Bay, Mournview and Lurgan and uh, North Antrim and expansion into other geographic areas is being considered within the context of planning uh, for phase two uh, of, the, of the projects. Uh, the member has also raised the, um, what I think comes from the recent media uh, coverage uh, lately um, about the Communities in Transition uh, project. And of course, I can confirm um, that this money, this funding, is not uh, for paramilitary organisations. Um, it is Communities in Transition. The clue is in the title. It is to help and assist those communities um, that are most at risk of coming under the, the course of control of paramilitary organisations. So I think um, that it's very important that we support uh, those communities. And we have to look at the projects that are involved. This is about helping people with mental health. It's about helping with employability uh, and skills, all sorts of things that we want to, to see happen which also then reduces the, the impact, the influence and the control that paramilitaries uh, can have. And I think it's very important that it's put clearly on the record today uh, what this money is for, what it is intended for and what it is actually doing and the positive work that is going on in communities. And I can say it in my own uh, constituency, the really positive impacts and the life-changing impacts that it is actually having uh, on people in our constituencies. Nicole Daniel McCrossan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, uh, First Minister, for your answers to the question so far. First Minister, can I ask you, first of all, before answering my question, that when you address this House, you do so with facts? You addressed this House last week, First Minister, with incorrect uh, claims against me uh, that, that uh, were totally wrong. So I would appreciate it if spurious remarks were not made by the First Minister. But, First Minister, Mr. Speaker, how do you ensure uh, quality of delivery and value for money for community and transition spend, and is this going to be made public? Well, I think that we only need to look at the outcomes, um, Mr. Speaker, of some of the impacts that these uh, have had uh, already. And the outcomes that we have had are, are exactly what it is that we are, are wanting uh, to achieve. Um, so I think that we have a very clear record uh, of that. That's why we're moving into phase two. It's why more funding has become uh, available. Uh, of course, the, the process is open and transparent. Projects are awarded uh, through an open procurement uh, process. Therefore, any organisation which is registered on the public sector procurement portal, eTenders NI, can bid to be part of the delivery framework uh, for the uh, project. Um, so there are uh, rules um, procedures uh, in place to make sure that this money is spent in the, in the right way, and I think we're seeing the, uh, the impacts of that. They call Sunir Bradley. Four. And with your permission, Mr. Speaker, I will answer questions four and ten together. 
Since the end of the transition period, it has been a priority both within our department and across the wider executive to identify, assess and seek to resolve issues that are having an impact on our businesses. The Deputy First Minister and I have met with Michael Gove and the European Commission Vice President Maros Szeczkovic to outline the challenges we are facing, and I note their public commitment to find solutions and to engage with our business groups and civic society. We continue to engage at both ministerial and official level with the United Kingdom's government and others as relevant. Throughout all of our engagement, we have taken every opportunity to highlight the need to resolve issues and to ensure that the additional burdens and costs for our people and our businesses are minimised. One of the key agreed objectives of the Executive is to ensure, insofar as possible, unfettered trade between ourselves and the rest of the United Kingdom. As an Executive, we regularly review uh, related uh, issues to the end of the transition period, as well as preparations for the end of the grace period, including those that the United Kingdom Government unilaterally extended in March of 2021. Mr. Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the First Minister for her reply. Um, the First Minister, I think all in this House can agree Brexit and the outworking protocol were inevitably going to raise up issues and uh, transition period that, that would be challenging. But would the First Minister agree with me and the many business people that recognise all of those problems are solvable and can be worked through? And does she believe this place has a duty to reach out and support all those businesses and not be an obstacle to finding solutions? I thank the member for her question and, and just to say, that of course, the solution and the way to deal with all of the huge difficulties that businesses are facing is to replace the protocol. Uh, that is very clear uh, because uh, just when you think you have answered one uh, issue with the protocol, another arises. And of course, that's the difficulty with the protocol because as the European Union continues to implement regulations, uh, we will diverge from uh, the internal market of the United Kingdom. Therefore, the protocol uh, does indeed uh, need to be dealt with, and I support businesses uh, in doing that. I spent some of Friday uh, listening to the extra costs which businesses are having uh, to absorb um, as a result of this iniquitous protocol, and it is long past the time when our government acted to make sure that the protocol was gone. Well, Alex Easton. And I thank the First Minister for answers so far. What recent discussions has the First Minister had with local businesses around the protocol, which the current situation is clearly extremely challenging? And what differences does she envisage if the grace periods were to actually end? So I want to thank the member for uh, accommodating me in order to speak to some businesses in his own constituency on Friday. Uh, I find it really very useful, uh, and I want to thank him for that. Uh, I was, I have to say, alarmed at the extra cost that those businesses are having to incur. Some of them, of course, are passing them on to consumers and to their clients, which is very worrying as well. So we're seeing a reduction uh, of choice, uh, an increase in cost, all as a result of uh, the protocol being implemented in the fashion that it has been. If the grace periods, of course, were to come to an end, we've heard already from the Chief Vet in Northern Ireland that the number of checks that he would be required to do would just be unworkable. Uh, of course, the checks that are being carried out at present are completely disproportionate to the risk to the single market. We're all very aware of that. However, the European Union continues uh, to push ahead and try to implement the protocol, which is doing no, uh, I, I mean, uh, the amount of damage that is happening to our businesses is quite incalculable. So, uh, we will need to continue to try and get the protocol replaced so that we can move on. Call John O'Dowd. Minister, one of the ways which our society and this institution can face the challenges of Brexit and COVID and economic recovery is through north, south, east, west uh, cooperation. And over this last 24 hours, we've heard a number of reasons as to why your party hasn't been turning up at north, south ministerial meetings. Mr. Lyons has just told us it's for dairy reasons. Yesterday, your deputy leader of your party told us it was in opposition to the protocol. Will you assure this House and others that your party will not use north-south cooperation in your campaign against the protocol? Well, firstly, you have misrepresented uh, what the deputy leader of my party said yesterday, not for the first time. Uh, and just to answer Mr McCrossan's point earlier on, I can show him the uh, post that he put up, if he would like me to show it to him, because he had it up before anybody else 
had it up, and that was the point I was making. Uh, order, I also order, 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 members. Excuse me, Mr. McCrossan. Order, when you are requested, First Minister. So, just to be clear, uh, with Mr. O'Dowd, who uh, has asked the question, um, I have made it clear at all times that I and colleagues will act in the interests of the people of Northern Ireland and in accordance with all of our ministerial responsibilities and, indeed, the pledge of office, as we have indicated. And there has been much uh, misplaced, quite mischievous, of course, I expect that from political opponents, and we have heard it here again today, that we are refusing, in inverted commas, to attend uh, meetings between the Northern Ireland Executive uh, and the Government of the Republic of Ireland, and it is simply not the case. Uh, I spoke with the Taoiseach on uh, Friday week ago, actually, by telephone. However, just to be clear, the Northern Ireland Protocol is not part of the North-South Ministerial Council. Uh, as we have outlined some weeks ago, um, North-South relationships will, of course, be affected by the fact that the Protocol is in place because it has damaged East-West uh, relationships. Um, and we need to sort it out. We need to get rid of the protocol so that we can continue to have relationships with our nearest neighbour in the appropriate way uh, in the future, so that the constitutional and economic position uh, of Northern Ireland uh, is something that every community can benefit from, as opposed to the dreadful situation that we currently find ourselves in. Call Tim Allister. Does the First Minister have any comment on the repetition last week of the false propaganda by the Vice President of the EU that the protocol is the only way to protect the Belfast Agreement and to preserve peace and stability? Can the First Minister tell me, is there a single passage in the Belfast Agreement that prevented the United Kingdom from leaving as one nation, that prevented uh, the two parts of Ireland belonging to ding different single markets and that required a border in the Irish Sea. And if the protocol, by its very authors, is built on such flagrant falsehoods, how is such a warped and intolerable imposition meant to be experienced and endured? Does she agree it must go? Well, I do agree with the member that the protocol uh, should go, and he, he rightly points out um, the misrepresentation uh, by the European Commission Vice President uh, and the fact that he either willfully misunderstands the Belfast Agreement or is misrepresenting it for his own ends. Uh, I know not which. Uh, but what I will say uh, is that there is a need for those in Europe, in London, uh, in Dublin as well, to listen to the voices of those of us who will not have the protocol because it is damaging uh, the economy of Northern Ireland, but more than that, it is damaging our citizenship here in Northern Ireland as equal citizens of the United Kingdom because we cannot partake in the internal market of the United Kingdom. Something, as I'm sure he will be aware, was part very much at the core of the Act of Union back all of those years ago. So it is fundamentally important that we continue uh, to put the point across that the protocol must go. Call Steve Egan. May I thank the First Minister for her answer so far. Uh, at a recent, the Chair of the Senate Committee for the United Kingdom leaving the EU recently said that the protocol damages the Belfast Agreement. Does the First Minister believe that any political party in Northern Ireland can no longer call for its rigorous implementation because it is indeed so damaging to Northern Ireland. I thank the member for uh, his uh, question and his comments. Uh, I was made aware of those comments by his colleague at the Committee of the Executive Office last week. I was very interested to hear them, uh, actually, uh, that there is a realisation um, that the protocol is damaging the Belfast Agreement, something which his party uh, was very much involved in from the outset. And therefore, I do take on board what he says, and there is absolutely a need to deal with it, and to deal with it as quickly as possible. They call Palm Cameron. Question number five, please. Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I will answer questions five and eleven together. As part of the four-week review process outlined in the pathway out of restrictions, the executive took a wide range of decisions last Thursday to reopen many aspects of our economy and society over the coming weeks. The Deputy First Minister and I outlined these in our statement to the Assembly's ad hoc committee last week. 
All of our decisions on relaxations that we have taken since the pathway was launched at the start of March have been informed by the data, and we are continued and committed to keeping them under review. We appreciate the sacrifices that have been made to reduce the spread of the virus, and in that knowledge we have reached these decisions carefully to balance the need to control transmission with the need to open up our economy and society again. However, the lifting of restrictions does not mean we can let our guard down. It is down to all of us to continue to adhere with the measures we are now so familiar with to protect the relaxations we have worked so hard to achieve. And by that I mean maintaining social distancing, washing our hands, wearing a face covering and continue to use the Stop COVID NI app. Palm Cameron, supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the First Minister for her answer. Can I ask the First Minister um, if she would um, give us assurance that, um, for businesses in particular, that as COVID data continues to improve, economic recovery will be an, an ever-increasing focus of the executive going forward? I thank the member for her question and uh, absolutely concur that uh, economic recovery must now be uh, very much our number one focus. Uh, we know that there are industries and businesses right across Northern Ireland who have been in a really dire situation over this past year. We have tried to help um, through mitigations and through uh, grants uh, being made available to those companies, but we totally understand that the best way to recover is to be open and to be able to uh, continue with businesses. Can I say uh, it is really uh, of good news today that I say, Mr Speaker, that there is now an opportunity for those in the age gap, uh, gap 35 to 39 to book their COVID vaccine. That was just announced by the Department of Health at one o'clock. So those people who are in that uh, age gap can now avail of the COVID vaccine and I would very much encourage them, if there's anybody in that age gap in this House, to make sure that they take that up. Thank you, Minister. I call Good day, Kian Cardinal, and could thank the Minister for answers. Minister, the pandemic has clearly highlighted the deep rooted disadvantage and deprivation um, across many parts of our community. Can the Minister assure us that at the core of any recovery strategy that uh, social inequalities will be addressed? I thank the member for his question. And indeed, um, we have tried throughout this pandemic to talk about the impact on health uh, and the well-being of our people, uh, but also to look at the economic well-being and the societal well-being. So those three elements are the three elements that will inform uh, the strategy of the executive uh, moving forward. I think that those are the three core elements to what we're trying to achieve. But we do, of course, recognise, and I'm sure the member will agree, that having a job is very much part of dealing with some of that societal disadvantage uh, that some have uh, in their lives. And that's why uh, making sure that there are suitable and well-paid jobs available for everyone uh, is something that we should very much strive towards. Call and I thank the, the First Minister for her responses. Um, as we come out of lockdown and move towards economic recovery, part of that recovery should be building on the unique status that we have under the protocol, something that Invest NI has been promoting. And I understand there has been significant interest within Invest NI in relation to that, with at least 30 investors exploring opportunities here since the end of the transition period. So can I ask the, the First Minister to comment on that level of interest and does she agree that we need to be maximising opportunities under the Protocol. Well, unfortunately, because of the damage which the protocol has visited upon us here in Northern Ireland in terms of our largest market, we haven't been able to uh, take as much advantage of the interests from other parts of the world as we would have liked. Uh, I, I find that very disappointing. Um, the fact that our largest market has been hampered in the way that it has, I think, has caused great damage. Uh, and that's why we need to see the protocol dealt with as soon as we possibly can, so that we can then go out into the world and take advantage of our young people, the skills that they have, the fact that we have such a strong educational base here, uh, the need to bring back uh, our young people. And there was a, a recent report on this, Mr. Speaker, from Pivotal about the brain drain out of Northern Ireland, the fact that we need those brightest and best to stay here in Northern Ireland. Those are the things that we need to focus on uh, in our forthcoming economic recovery. I'm going to call John Stewart. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for letting me in. Um, thank you, First Minister, for her answer so far. Um, in terms of those sectors last to open, hospitality, including the wedding sector, and also tourism, will be most affected and have been most affected throughout this. Can you give an assurance to the House and to those sectors that financial support will be there, will continue, even when they open in a partial way, to support them through this? Thank you. Well, certainly the decision of the Executive last week was that the financial support would continue until they were fully reopened again. Um, Some of those uh, hospitality venues who have outside premises can open, as he knows, on the 30th of April, but their support will continue uh, because they cannot open fully, and we think that that is the right thing to do. Very conscious of the fact that there are many within the wedding industry who have suffered greatly. But I, I, I mean, my heart goes out to those who have had to organise. I was speaking to a couple at the weekend. Four times they've reorganised their wedding. I mean, that is just incredible. What a stress that is on our young people. And maybe not so young as well. I'm not going to be ages. But uh, it is important that we continue to give support to the industry. And I know the Economy Minister is, con- is, is continuing to keep in close contact with the industry to see what else we need to do to help them. That ends the period for a list of questions, and we now move to 15 minutes of topical questions. And I call Sinead McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I ask the Minister, under Section 52 of the Northern Ireland Act, sets out the legal duty on ministers to attend meetings of the North South Ministerial Council, and where there is any doubt um, over which minister should attend, it is up to the First Minister and uh, Deputy First Minister to attend. On what basis? Did you fail to nominate someone to last week's North South Ministerial Sector sector meeting? The sectoral meeting, uh, which the uh, Transport Minister, uh, Ms Mallon, decided would go ahead, despite the fact that she had been told that it did not suit uh, the nominated person who would accompany with her, uh, despite the fact that the agenda and the papers had not been agreed uh, by my office. Uh, you know, North-South Ministerial Councils are to proceed by agreement. That's the whole point, that there is a, a Unionist Minister there when a Nationalist Minister is in the lead, and vice versa. So the, all of these things have to uh, proceed by agreement, and I very much hope that agreement and consensus will be sought by those Ministers setting up North-South Ministerial Councils in the future. Supplementary, Sinead McLaughlin. Thank you, uh, First Minister, for your answer. Um, now that you are quite well aware of um, the distress that not appointing someone to attend that meeting has caused um, to this House generally, um, will you be assuring this House that um, the Minister Dodds will be attending the meeting later on this week, or is there some excuse that we might learn now that that will be impossible to? Oh, the distress is. Uh, um, my goodness, if this is what distress looks like, I hate to see what real distress actually looks like. But in terms of the NSMC, I've indicated to Mr O'Dowd, I will indicate to you as well, I'm fully aware of our ministerial responsibilities as outlined in the Pledge of Office. I have told her why the meeting did not go ahead. It is up to her whether she believes it or not. That's a matter for her. That is the reality, that there was not agreement on the agenda, despite the fact uh, that her minister decided to tweet the draft agenda on Thursday night, thereby breaching uh, ministerial protocol by putting papers uh, which are for the executive uh, out into the public realm, which not for the first time, I have to say, from the SDLP. However, that is a matter for her. Uh, George Robinson is not in his place, and the next question, three, has been withdrawn. I now call Mark Durkin. Uh, could I ask for Mark Durkin to be brought on screen? Could you invite Mark Durgan to ask your question, please? Gura Mayogut, I thank the First Minister for her answers thus far. The Minister will be well aware of the scale of the challenge we face to address mental health issues here. We were in a bad place pre-pandemic. Uh, we're in an even worse place now if we're listening to any of the experts. Uh, responsibility doesn't lie solely with the Minister for Health. Could the Minister outline what plans the Executive has to address our mental health crisis? Member, uh, for his uh, question, uh, a subject which he returns to frequently, and uh, can I commend him for that? Uh, the subcommittee of the Executive, which deals with uh, mental health resilience and wellbeing and suicide prevention, is one of the best attended, I have to say, subcommittees of the Executive. It's one that we all take 
very, very seriously, and we want to interact with those health professionals that come uh, to that subcommittee. The last subcommittee we were briefed by uh, the interim mental health champion um, when she was able to bring us up to date with what interventions are going on at that time. So that committee continues, as he rightly says, to have a whole of government approach uh, to the mental health issue. Of course, primacy lies with the Minister of Health, but we all, as an executive, stand four square behind the Minister of Health as he tries to deal with this incredible difficulty, which unfortunately, Mr Speaker, is only going to get worse as we move out of the pandemic. I call Mark Duggan, supplementary. Answer, and I do hope that this is one thing that can unite parties and people here. Political discord and instability does nothing uh, to help our population's mental well-being. As chair of the all-party group on mental health, I'd like to take this opportunity to ask the first and deputy first ministers and indeed all the MLAs to unite in support of Mental Health Awareness Week that's coming next month and renew their commitment to tackling the pandemic of poor mental health. Uh, the member for that, and, and indeed, um, not going to speak on behalf of the Deputy First Minister, but I'm sure that if there's something he would like us to do to mark that collectively, we would be more than uh, happy to look at that, because I think it is something that unites everybody, uh, not just in the executive, but right across this House. Uh, and it's about how we intervene in a timely fashion uh, to try and, and, and deal with some of these issues. So that's why the subcommittee is not just about suicide prevention. It is actually about resilience and well-being as well to try and deal with those early intervention issues. So I very much look forward to if the member feels that we can help in relation to that if he would like to, to write to us. I call Rosemary Barton. Thank you, Minister, so far for your answers. Uh, Minister, I'm going to return to weddings. Again, it must be something that's in the air about Fermanagh. But just to say to you, I have had representation from a number of couples like, like yourself over the, over the weekend, and it's in relation to hotels opening, etc. Can you clarify the position over the wedding receptions and the position regarding music and dancing at weddings? So this um, is something she's right to identify because it is something I had to deal with over the weekend. So in terms of uh, a wedding reception, um, that's on a risk assessed basement from the 24th of May, um, depending on the size of the venue, um, again, like the churches uh, in terms of that. Uh, in terms of music uh, and dancing, uh, we still have not uh, clarity in relation to that, but it's something that we will want to continue to speak to our medical advisors about. Um, they are concerned, obviously, uh, because uh, singing and dance uh, is quite aerobic, that that would cause some difficulties, but it's something that we're very much aware of and are happy to come back to the House about in due course. Supplementary, Rosemary Barton. Yeah. Minister, you'll also be aware that many couples have organised and reorganised wed weddings. Many have actually lost deposits. On, as, a result, as a result of this, can, these, can those services that have held on to the deposits, can they also claim from the various COVID uh, schemes and grants that have been made available from them, for them? The short answer is, unfortunately, I'm not, a, I, I'm not over the detail in relation to that, but I'm happy to take that to the Economy Minister, who should, under consumer law, be able to give some clarity in relation to that, whether, because of the loss of the deposit, can they then claim that back through some of the, uh, the grant schemes? So, so let me take that away and, and get the Economy Minister to come back to her on that. Nicole Trevor Clark. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask you, First Minister, uh, and I'm welcome the fact that the uh, historical, abuse, sorry, historical abuse stuff has got moving. The address board is meeting, but has, there, there seems to be a, a general uh, opinion with, from some about dissatisfaction with the address board. Um, has any of that reached your department yet? Well, yes. In, in terms of the historical institutional abuse, um, the deputy first minister and I met with the uh, new commissioner Fiona Ryan, who has been put in place to be an advocate uh, for all of those um, people who come forward. Uh, with their stories, uh, and that was a very useful meeting for us. I know a number of members across the House have been contacted by uh, those people who are applying to the redress board because they are, have concerns that the process is actually causing uh, distress to some of those individuals. It is something I think the Deputy First Minister addressed in her last question time appearance, so it's, it is something we are aware of. 
uh, and something that we will be getting a briefing on to see if there's anything that we can do to assist, because the last thing we want to do is to cause any sort of re-traumatisation to those people. Supplementary, Trevor Clark. And I suppose, in essence, you, you've answered that. I suppose, given that it has been a difficult journey for many and the long journey in terms of that waiting, and I, I suppose it's inevitable that any conversation they have is they're going to revisit that past. So, so I welcome the fact that you're going to look at that. Um, could you give us any idea of what maybe could be done in relation to that to actually soften that for some of the individuals involved? We're here to hear uh, of the experience and what it is about the process that is causing problems. Uh, you will know, Mr Clark, that uh, for victims, whether it's through this sort of abuse or other sort of abuses um, and violence, um, that there's a different reaction from each individual as to what they are having to go through. Uh, so we will want to listen to those voices and indeed engage uh, with the Commissioner again to see if she can give any clarity as to suggestions on what can be changed in the process to try and help. Can I call the member Sean Lynch on screen, please? The member is not in his place. We move on to, I call Pat Catney. Mr. Catney is not in his place. I call Pat Sheehan. Could I ask the First Minister for an update on progress uh, by the HIA Redress uh, Board in terms of payments made to date? Thank you. Unfortunately, I do not have the precise uh, numbers of payments made to date, but we are. are a Bear in mind the last uh, question, and I want to take into account that answer when I'm replying to the member. Uh, we're pleased to see the number of uh, cases that have been going through the redress board, but again, we will want to take into consideration some of the distress that has been pointed to us so that we can actually try and see if there's an answer to some of that. I thank the First Minister for her answer. And I wonder, could she tell us if any resources have been directed to increasing the number of panels so that uh, the speed of payments can also be uh, speeded up? Thank you. I don't think we've identified that as a particular issue in terms of speed of payments. I think they are going uh, quite well. Some cases, as he will know, will obviously be more complicated than others and will take a little bit uh, more time. But some of the issues that have been raised with us in terms of the distress has been the fact that medical reports have had to be achieved again and that causes some difficulties uh, that people have to go through that process again. So as I say, we will be looking at the HIA process to see if there's anything more that we can do to try and deal with the problems that have been identified. And on the Allen's net on this place, so I ask members to take their ease until 2.45, two or three minutes. Thank you.